Welcome and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants will be on a listen-only mode until the question and answer session of today's conference. To ask a question from the phone lines, please press star 1 and record your name when prompted. To be mindful of time, please ensure that you restrict to one question and one follow-up. This conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, please disconnect at this time. I would now like to turn the call over to your host, Deborah Rivera. You may begin. Great. Thank you, Victor. So good afternoon, everybody. As Victor stated, my name is Deborah Rivera. I am a training specialist for the Census Bureau. I'd like to start off, as we always do, by giving everybody a warm welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. And as most of you know, this is a continuation of our Census Academy webinar series. Our topic for today is 2020 Decennial Operations. Joining me today is our speaker, Kale Bauer, as well as Kim Davis. Kim Davis is going to be assisting me today in monitoring the chat and also providing technical assistance. Just a few housekeeping items before we get started. We are recording this webinar, and along with any transcripts and PowerPoint slides that are used for the presentation, we will be posting this to the Census Academy site as a free learning resource. So you should be able to revisit that within the next couple of days. Hopefully by Friday, we should have everything up and running. Um, we will have a live question and answer session, and that's going to take place at the end of the presentation. But we also encourage you to use the chat feature if you would prefer to submit any questions in written form. The chat feature can be located towards the right-hand side of your WebEx screen. It is, however, very important that when you use the chat feature, you please use the drop-down menu and select all panelists, and you submit the question that way. And that way, both Kim and I can see your questions and try to answer them as quickly as possible. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker for today, Kale Bauer. Kale Bauer is the Chief of the Integrated Partnerships and Communications Branch in the Decennial Communications and Coordination Office. A little bit about Kill Bauer. Um, she and this is she. As I, sorry, as I stated, she is the chief of the Integrated Partnerships and Communications Branch. And in this position, Kale is responsible for the strategic planning and management of the federal government's largest civic engagement campaign, the Integrated Partnerships and Communications, or IPC, operation for the 2020 Census. And this campaign has the unique goal to reach every single person in the country. The 2020 Census IPC efforts combine multiple outreach areas, including advertising, recruitment, social media, and local, regional, and national partnerships to form the public face of the 2020 Census. Um, thank you so much for being with us today, Kale. Thank you, Dev. Hi, everyone. I am very excited to be able to be here with you today and talk a bit about the 2020 Census. As Deb mentioned, I'm going to ask you to hold the questions till the end of the presentation, but definitely feel free to pop them into the chat window as we go along and you think about them. So I'm hoping that you really come away with this presentation with three main takeaways. One, that the Census is important. Two, that the Census is easy. And three, that the Census is safe. So let's get started. Now, our massive 2020 Census multimedia advertising campaign really starts to ramp up this week. And we're re going to be reaching almost all of the 140 million households across the country with messaging about the importance of responding. By the time invitations to answer the form arrive between March 12th and March 20th, more than 99% of America's households will have been exposed to at least 26 ads, be them on TV, radio, newspaper, online, out on billboards, or even bus stops. You are not going to be able to get away from the, from the advertising about the census. We are very excited about this campaign. So I'm going to start off with a short video that is part of our campaign. This video is going to give you that, the feel for the inclusivity and importance of the census. In America, we all count, no matter where we call home, how we worship, or who we love. And the 2020 census is how that great promise is kept. Because this is the count that informs where hundreds of billions in funding will go each year for things like education, health care, and programs that touch us all. Shape your future. 
start here. Learn more at 2020census.gov. So, why is the census so important? Well, the census is all about power and money. The distribution of more than $675 billion in federal funding every year is based on the decennial census data that is collected only once a decade. So think about it. It's basically an entire childhood of time that is dependent on the results of the census. That, the money that communities receive is spent on things such as schools, hospitals, roads, public works, and other vital programs to the communities. Now let's talk about power. Every 10 years, the results of the census are used to reapportion the House of Representatives, determining how many seats each state gets. And the data is used by state officials to redraw the boundaries of the congressional and state legislative districts in their states to account for population shifts. So we're estimating there to be about 330 million people in the United States living in more than 140 million households, and we must count each and every one of them. To do this, we have five basic steps. We start by figuring out where people live. So this decade, we did this in a combination of an in-office work and in-field work. For the majority of addresses in the United States, we were able to verify they existed in an office setting using a combination of satellite imagery and address lists that were provided to us by state, local, and tribal governments. For the remaining addresses, we sent census takers out into the field with handheld devices to verify those addresses in areas where either the imagery was not clear, there were no locally provided address files, or there was just too much change happening on the ground. This operation, called address canvassing, took place in August of 2019 and was our first major operation for the 2020 census. Now, once we figure out where people are living, we then need to motivate them to respond. We do this through the Integrated Partnerships and Communications operation. You saw that video just the slide before. Now, after we motivate people to respond, we need to make it easy for them to do so. 2020 will be the first census that offers everyone a chance to respond online, by phone, or by mail. But we realize that no matter how seemingly easy we make it, not everyone will self-respond. This is where our non-response follow-up comes in. For those households who do not respond by the beginning of May, we will send census takers out into the field to assist households in completing the census. Now, still important to recognize that even though you will start seeing census takers in your neighborhood in May, June, and July, you will still be able to respond online, by phone, or by mail if you prefer. Once we have collected all the data, it is then time to tabulate the results. Our data dissemination begins on December 31st, 2020, when we deliver the apportionment counts to the president. These are the numbers that are used to determine the number of representatives each state gets in Congress. Following that, on a rolling basis, we will distribute the redistricting data to the states, with every state receiving their data by March 31st of 2021. After that, additional data tabulations will be released as they are developed. So to help us motivate the population, we have developed a large body of promotional and outreach materials in English and the 12 non-English languages the response instrument will be available in. And we'll get into a little more detail on those languages in a second. These materials include infographics, posters, brochures, and the like that cover all aspects of the 2020 census. These materials are critical to our partnership programs. We have an integrated partnership program that includes both national and regional and local partnerships. These programs are supported by over 1,500 partnership specialists across the country. If you want to take a look at these materials, you just go to 2020census.gov slash partners. You'll see outreach materials on the left-hand side, and you can click through. You can filter those by language or by topic. So we've also been busy developing our public relations, social media, 
events, and crisis communication efforts. Our public relations strategy will help drive our education and awareness efforts, particularly among those hard to count audiences. Crisis preparedness and communications will be more important than ever before with information spreading faster in this new digital environment. Our social media outreach offers a unique opportunity to personally engage with the public. We will leverage existing census channels and develop innovative approaches that help us promote our recruiting efforts, enhance our customer service, support digital and on the ground events, raise awareness, drive response, and even disseminate data. Now, if you're on Facebook or Instagram, I'm sure you have seen our ads. If you're not, I definitely recommend following us our social media team are rock stars, and the feeds are both informative and entertaining. Now, coming soon, you're even going to see a census Snapchat filter. The te my teams at home are very excited about that one. Hopefully, you have also seen we have a beautiful new website. The site now includes translated web pages and guides in 59 non-English languages, including American Sign Language and guides in Braille and large print. Coming in March, we'll be launching our response rate visualizations. That's where you can see just how well your community is doing in terms of uh, response. We also will be updating our content starting on March 12th to encourage self-response. Now in 2020 so far, we have seen over 14 million view visits to the site. If you haven't checked it out, I highly suggest that you do. We also have our widely popular Statistics in Schools program. This program teaches school children the importance of the census with the goal that they will take this information home to their parents. The heart of our program are the standards-based activities that use census data. This research is this resource is intended to supplement existing lesson plans and has been created by teachers for teachers. We have free resources and activities for grades pre-K to 12, and they cover subjects in English, social studies, geography, math, and sociology. You can go to census.gov schools to access existing resources and sign up for updates. Our expanded program for 2020 now includes even a pre-K storybook that we have in both English and Spanish, 67 activities, and there's even a super adorable Statistics in School song. We've developed three videos and, a, and Statistics in Schools and Count of Young Children public service announcements. In the fall, we mailed out over 14,500 kits to school superintendents across the country. Then, between last month and now, we have mailed almost 120,000 kits to school principals. These kits include wall maps for elementary, middle, and high school students, booklets, and flyers. So keep your ears open. And if you have contacts in the schools, reach out to them to encourage them to use these resources in their classrooms. If for whatever reason the school has not received the packet, they can reach out to our team here for help. Now, once we have the attention of the country, our next job is to collect your response to the census. And that's easy. This year, since you have the option of self-responding either online by phone or by mail, you can respond anytime from anywhere. And if submitting your information over the internet is not comfortable, remember, you can always still respond by phone or by mail. Nearly every household will receive an invitation to participate in the 2020 census from either a postal worker or a census worker. Now, one way we make the census easy is to meet the population where they are in terms of languages spoken. With the introduction of the Internet self-response for 2020, we are able to provide the Internet questionnaire in English and 12 non-English languages on demand for respondents. These languages are Spanish, Chinese, and it's simplified Chinese for the in online instrument, Vietnamese, Korean, 
Russian, Arabic, Tagalog, Polish, French, Haitian Creole, Portuguese, and Japanese. If you're thinking, that sounds like a weird order she read those off in, that order is actually the ranked in order of the number of people that speak those languages. Now we're also providing phone response in these 12 non-English languages. For Chinese, we will have a line in both Mandarin and Cantonese. And we also will have telecommunication device for the deaf. Additionally, we are providing support material in 59 languages. Our paper questionnaire and mailing materials and the field enumeration and materials, so what the census takers in the field will be using, will be available in English and Spanish. Now, as I said, we are providing support materials in 59 languages, which expands our support to over 99% of the language needs in the country. We have language guides in both video and print. We have language glossaries and language identification cards in those 59 non-English languages that you can see here on the screen. We also include American Sign Language, Braille, and large print. We also have shells and templates of our language guides, glossaries, and ID cards to help individuals such as community leaders and language experts support communities that speak languages or dialects that we may not be covering. This is a place where our integrated partnership operation comes into play. Now here you can see some important dates for self-response. We started off on January 21st, our remote Alaska operation. And I'll tell you a little bit more details on that in a couple of slides. But that was our first um, kickoff for response. Now, I talked about mailings and, and inv your invitation to respond. You will start seeing those arrive in your mailboxes, your first one, between March 12th and the 20th. And then Census Day is April 1st. Many communities will, are going to plan events around this day, and April 1st is that date when you're filling out your form. We're asking you to respond with the data as of April 1st. So let's talk a, bit, a little bit more about what you can expect in the mail. Between March 12th and the 20th, households across America will receive that invitation to participate in the census. The invitation will include information about how to respond online or by phone with phone numbers for each of the 12 non-English languages and the English phone number. It will also include a unique census ID. Now, this invitation that we send out will account for about 80% of the households. And their first mailing will not include a paper questionnaire. We are asking these households to please go online and fill out the form. But the remaining approximately 20% of the country are in areas where we are less confident that they will respond over the internet. Because of this, they will receive a paper questionnaire in that first mailing. We are sending a bilingual questionnaire in English and Spanish to an entire census tract if at least 20% of the occupied housing units in the tract may require Spanish assistance. So we, how do we define Spanish assistance? These are households in which at least one adult, age 15 or older, speaks Spanish and does not speak English very well. We base this assessment on data from our 2013 to 2017 American Community Survey. Now we're going to be working with the U.S. Postal Service to stagger the delivery of the invitations over several days. You might be asking why we do this. Well, it helps us to spread out the number of users responding online. It helps us serve you better if you need help over the phone. And it helps with the mail and data collection processes. Most important, though, by April 16th, every household that has not responded to the census will receive a paper questionnaire. And then, between April 20th and the 27th, we will send one final reminder postcard to remind people that it is not too late to respond. On May 13th, we will begin to follow up with in-person field visits to those addresses that have not yet responded. 
we do have some different approaches, though, for certain areas of the country. One of those is up, what we call update leave. This happens in areas of the country where the majority of housing units do not have mail delivered by the United States Postal Service to the physical location of the address. So we know a lot of people in the country um, have mail sent to PO boxes. That's an example of that. We also are classifying in this update leave areas, areas that have experienced recent and significant changes to the housing stock. So if you think about the hurricanes and the earthquakes in Puerto Rico, the, here's where we conduct update leave. This is a combination of address canvassing that I talked about we did in the last summer and self-response. The diff only difference here is instead of the postal service dropping off the, in, the questionnaire, our census takers will go to the household, they will update the address list, and then they will drop off a packet hung on your door with your census questionnaire and instructions to complete the form. Then we also have areas where the initial visit requires a direct enumeration rather than a follow-up visit. Here's where we conduct update enumerate. This is in geographically remote areas that tend to have low housing unit density. These are sparsely populated and have challenges with accessibility. So think about remote areas of Maine, Southeast, Southeast Alaska, and some select American Indian areas. And then we have remote Alaska, which is going on right now. This operation takes care of remote geographic areas that have unique challenges associated with accessibility in Alaska. We need to go when the tundra is still frozen and we can travel to the villages where people live before they relocate to hunting camps away from the villages. To do this, we work with village leaders to identify, identify and hire census takers who speak the local language and can translate and facilitate the collection of census data. Now, as we have some special collection methods based on geography, we also have some special collection methods based on populations. These are operations that are tailored to other living situations. First, we have what we call group quarters. So group quarters are where unrelated adults live or stay in a group living arrangement. These are owned or managed by an entity or organization that provides housing and services for the residents. So think about nursing homes or college dormitories. Group quarters have gatekeepers or administrators who we work with to facilitate enumeration. We also conduct service-based enumeration. This provides an opportunity for people without conventional housing or people experiencing homelessness to be included in the census by enumerating them at places where they receive services or at pre-identified outdoor locations. So when you're thinking about this, we're thinking about missions and places for adults and children who are um, runaways, neglected, or experiencing homelessness. Soup kitchens that offer meals, regularly, regularly scheduled mobile food vans, emergency and transitional shelters. We also visited targeted non-sheltered outdoor locations. It's a big name for basically um, so areas such as under viaducts, in ca cars and groups in store parking lots, parks, benches, or other places where you may find a homeless encampment. Here, partners and advocacy organizations help us to build a location list of missions, shelters, soup kitchens, and the other locations where people experiencing homelessness congregate. We will visit these locations close to Census Day, so this year it'll be between March 30th and April 1st, to conduct our enumeration. We also conduct enumeration of transitory locations. So here's where we count people who are highly mobile and do not have a usual home elsewhere. Here you're thinking about people who live in campgrounds, RV parks, hotels and motels, marinas, racetracks, and even circuses and carnivals. We also collect a federally affiliated count from overseas. Here, 
we receive counts from military personnel and their dependents stationed overseas from defense manpower, as well as from other federal agencies who have staff stationed overseas. And then we also have special procedures for military enumeration. Military installations and barracks in the U.S. work with our census takers to determine the best method of collection for each base. Now, I'd like to turn to a new operation that is developing. In 2010, we provided what we call the Be Counted Centers, where people who did not receive a questionnaire could come and get a form. But then they had to take that form home, fill it out, and then get it back to us in the mail. For 2020, because you can respond from any time, anywhere, we are no longer providing one-off paper forms. Instead, we are going to provide response assistance, and they will be, there will be about 4,700 of them across the country. They will look at response rates and then visit the areas where response is lacking. They will have tablets so they can, people can use the tablet to respond, and they will also be able to show people how to respond via their own mobile device or a system in calling our census questionnaire line. Now, to easily identify staff and this operation, staff will wear a teal polo shirt with a 2020 logo. They will also have a Census Bureau bag and an Census Bureau ID. Now, despite all of our best efforts, we know that not everybody will respond to the census on their own. But we still need to count those people. To do this, we have an operation that we call non-response follow-up. Beginning in May, we will send census takers into neighborhoods to follow up with those households who have not yet responded and assist them in responding. This is the largest non-military mobilization of the population that this country conducts. It's also, I'm sure you can imagine, the most expensive component of the census. Now we start in early May, let's see May 13th here, after we've done everything we can, can do to get people to self-respond. If we cannot secure an interview with someone in the non-responding household, we will attempt to get a proxy response from a neighbor or apartment manager, basically someone who can give us information about the household. We are very serious in our mission to include everyone in this once a decade count. Now, I want to assure you, assure you that the 2020 census is safe. Your responses are confidential, and all employees are sworn for life to protect your information. Your information cannot be shared with other government agencies, local law enforcement, or anyone, not even immigration. We will not release your individual data Instead, we aggregate the data and produce statistics about the population. Now, once we have collected all of the responses, we need to tabulate the data. Two we produce two legally mandated products. We have the apportionment counts that are delivered to the president no later than December 31st of 2020. The next, uh, the next product that we tabulate are the redistricting data files. These are the apportionment counts for each state, and we deliver these on a state-by-state -state rolling basis beginning toward the end of February and finishing with all states by March 31st of 2021. More products will be developed, and as they are developed, they will be released through 2023. Now, I have an ask for you. We need census takers. These are great, flexible, part, great paying, flexible part-time jobs that will allow you to take a valuable role in shaping your community for the next 10 years. For more information on these great jobs, you can go to 2020census.gov slash jobs. And please share this information with anyone who may be interested. These are great second jobs to get a little more income they are also great for those college students home for the summer. 
and even retirees who are looking for something to fill up their days. Now in, now in closing, I'm going to show you one of our public service announcements that we've developed. This is called They Also Count. This public service announcement explains that no matter where you're from, your nationality, your immigration status, or who you live with, the U.S. Census counts everyone. The census counts everyone in this country, and that really means everyone. A hospital patient, yes, that person counts. Newborn Benjamin, yeah, little Ben now counts. Two families that live in the same house, sure thing, they all count. Or David, who's living in his cousin Daniel's garage, he also counts. The census counts everyone to make things better for all of us. So, I want to thank you for your time today. I hope you learned a lot, but most importantly, that the census is important, easy, and safe. Um, I can turn to now take questions. Thank you. We will now begin a question and answer session. To ask a question from the phone lines, please press star 1, ensure your phone is unmuted, and record your name at the prompt. Again, please limit to one question and one follow-up. Please stand by for callers. Okay, thank you so much. And while we wait for any questions that might be queuing up, I'm going to, we picked some uh, really great questions that came in through the chat feature, and I'll be reading those out loud now for our speaker. Um, so we have a question from Sophia. She wants to know, are incarcerated individuals included in the census? They sure are. Uh, people who are inca incarcerated are counted at the facility where they are living. Okay, thank you. And this question comes from Mary. How long will the online response be kept open? Is it the end of April or July? So you can respond online through the end of July. That allows people who are not comfortable talking to a census taker or being visited by one of census staff to still have that option to go online and respond. Great, thank you so much. Okay, um, let's see if we have any questions on the phone. Okay, and we do. Our first question comes from Alan. Your line is open. Hi, folks. Um, I wrote a question on the chat, but uh, I'm uh, on board as a census enumerator, and um, I was told that we would begin our field work in March, but you said it's not going to start until May. So uh, I'm just curious about which is, which is correct. Hi, Alan. Welcome. I'm so happy to hear we have a census taker on the line. Thank you for your service. So when I received when I responded, when I spoke about May, I was speaking specifically about our non-response follow-up operation. In March, we do have census takers that will be working in those update leave and update enumerate areas. So that, that is when those people will start in March. That's a much smaller number of census takers than it is for non-response follow-up. Does that make sense? It, it absolutely does. Great. Thank you. Our next question comes from Anita Bolton. Your line is open. Hi, thank you. Uh, so my question is that uh, I had applied for the census taker um, back in last year. Um, now I had got uh, contacted back about a supervisor's position, but then I don't know what happened with it. Uh, I did call them, uh, call you guys back, and they said something about. Um, it took a while for my background check to come back and to just reapply. And so I reapplied. And so the site says that my application is approved, but I hadn't heard anything from anyone. So I was just wondering what would be the next step for me to do to just hear something back and, you know, get a T-shirt and, you know, just go through the, the ropes of things. Sure, Anita. Thank you for applying to work with us. Um, what we can do is we'll send a link through the chat that shows you the steps of the application process and a number you can follow up with. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. 
Our next question comes from Robin Stelly. Your line is open. Um, yeah, did you say that people have until the end of July to complete the survey online? They do. The, um, thank you. The instrument, the internet response instrument will be open through July. However, if people do not respond by May, they will be started to receive visits from census takers. And one more thing, those mobile response centers, how do you know when, if one's going to be in your community? Yeah, so those will be um, organized by our local field offices, and they will have um, communications and advertisements about it. You will likely see these popping up at different festivals um, and fairs where we know people are congregating. In certain areas where there is low response and there might not be an event, you'll very likely see them at um, outside a grocery store, kind of like Girl Scout cookies. Um, we are also working with libraries across the country to have, uh, provide people computers to respond there. Thank you. You're welcome. Our next question comes from Roxana Bloom. Your line is open. Hello. Uh, yes, I'm happy to uh, hear the presentation today. I was interested in it, and I am working as a census taker when they finally call me. But my uh, question has been answered by one of the previous uh, people. Uh, I was wondering also when they would call us to uh, start performing our duties. And uh, that's, that's why I called. Great. Thank you, Roxana. Our next question comes from Max Reyes. Your line is open. Hi there. Uh, Max Reyes with Bloomberg News. Just one question. You mentioned some other data products you'd be rolling out by 2023. I was just wondering if you could go into more detail about those products. What exactly are we talking about when we mention those? So I don't have specifics on data products right now with me, but if you would like to contact our public information office at 301-763-3030, um, they can get you that information in writing. Thanks. Our next question comes from Rebecca Winters. Your line is open. Hi. Um, my question is, I'm wondering what the best way to convince a skeptical person that their data is completely confidential. If they have concerns about it, I'm wondering if um, that had been discussed or thought about. Um, you know, sure. because some people mm -hmm. might be skeptical. Absolutely. Um, we actually started out in 2017 doing a lot of research into the attitudes, barriers, and motivators that people experience when they think about the census and they think about their responses, to, excuse me, to the census. And as part of that, as the name suggests, we really did, um, we found that things that prevent, are preventing people to respond, things that motivate people to respond. And we found a universal motivator is that community benefits really resonate with people across the country. But that information is most widely received from what we call trusted voices. So we work with our partners throughout the country to ensure people that the data we collect is held confidential. Title 13 of the U.S. Code requires us to keep that information held confidential or as employees we can face fines and jail time. I can tell you that is not something I'm interested in facing, nor do I believe the majority of census workers would. Um, so I think it's the way that we found what most works with those very skeptical people is to lay out the community benefits of responding to the census and the assurances by the law that their information will not be shared. Not be shared with anybody, not, not any mm -hmm. uh, government agency or... Anybody. No government agencies, not with ICE, not with the FBI, no one. Okay, well, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. You're very welcome. Our next question comes from Aaron Woods. Your line is open. 
Uh, yes, thank you very much. Um, my question has been answered um, do, uh, over the chat line, so um, I'm good. I will say that this uh, presentation is quite informative, and I'm enjoying it very much. Thank you. Thank you. And Victor, would you mind repeating the instructions again, um, just how to queue up for questions and how to um, withdraw questions? Absolutely. As a reminder, to ask a question from the phone lines, please press star 1, ensure your phone is unmuted, and record your name at the prompt. If your question has been answered, you can withdraw your question by pressing star 2. And again, as a reminder, please refrain to one question and one follow-up. Our next question comes from Rafael Menrosa. Your line is open. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. Hello. Oh, okay. Um, so, so my question has to do with employment. I work for the, um, the, uh, the address verification in South Florida, in Georgia, and South Carolina. And I was looking forward to work on this phase of the census. Now, um, I, I, I wasn't getting calls, and so I checked, I checked with the local office. And at the time, the the uh, interactive map showed the, that the um, uh, the employment um, quota for my county had been completed to 92 percent. So when I spoke to the people at the local center, they told me they would be calling me within two weeks, and that didn't happen. Uh, next time I checked, the quota had been uh, I think up to 112 percent, and I still I didn't get a call. Um, and so, you know, I every time I call the office, I sort of get a, yeah, we'll call you, and, and that's where it goes, and no response. So I'm concerned that uh, maybe I'm being way late and, you know, <laughs> nobody's really paying attention. So I don't know what to do because I do want to be part of this. I understand the importance of the process. And, and I, you know, by the way, I thank you for the presentation. It was really very good, very good. So, but how can I, what else can I do? Um, I, you know, I'd like to go to work and I, I see the, I've been talking to a vacuum here, you know? Yeah, thank you. And I apologize that you're struggling with the process. Um, unfortunately, I don't have information on your specific application, but I know that we are sending out the link that w you can get more information from. Um, I suggest that you follow up through that. Um, okay. And then if you can always reach out to your re local regional census office, yours is in Atlanta. Okay. Those links are also on our website, and they should be able to help okay. you. Okay, awesome. So thank you very much. And then you say that the, the link will be provided? Correct. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. thank you a lot. Very much. Thank you. Our next question comes from Jack Williams. Your line is open. Hello. Um, calling from the great state of Texas. Um, I wanted to, uh, <laughs> I really have enjoyed the information. It gives a feeling of um, great patriotism participating in this. I, um, I received a call uh, a few weeks ago and an interview of about 10 minutes was told that, and then there was a pause, and then told, told that I was an, asked me if I would be an enumerator, which I'd be glad to do and happy to do. But they said there'd also be coming a, a, an email, on my email or phone, uh, another email with uh, information on where to get fingerprinted. Mm -hmm. is, have I been scammed or is this really true? Uh, you do require f uh, to be fingerprinted to be a census taker. Um, so I would say if you have not received an email following up, I would again follow the um, instructions that we're sending to um, call the number and they can help you where exactly where you are in the process. It does take a little bit of time. We are processing a lot of applications. Um, so I know it can be frustrating, but we're just asking people to be patient. Well, I'm not, I'm not frustrated. I'm really, really looking forward to it. But, um, Excellent. Great. I'm, I'm kind of an old guy, but I'm, I'm using my phone. and. I'm looking on your website of uh, trying to find the other uh, trainings that have gone on before this because I'd like to take them all. Uh, am I, is there another website uh, that goes right to all the training that I missed? Yes, there is a link to the Census Academy website, and we will send that through the chat also. Okay, now on the chat, I'm on my phone, so will I see that on my phone as well? 
You know what, I'm going to look at Deb who's <laughs> running this because I'm not sure. So I can give you a very easy way to access all of our training resources. If you just go to census.gov, which I'm sure you're familiar with, and you just put in slash academy, it will bring you right to our training page and you can access recorded webinars and, of course, anything that's coming up in the next couple of days or months. So just census.gov slash academy. Um, but otherwise, this um, you know, if you wanted to follow up with me, just send your information directly to me via chat, and I'll follow up with you in an email if that if that works for you. And I'm sorry, and your name is? My name is Deborah. You can go to the um, – actually, no, because you're on the phone. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, let me think about that, but I'll get right back to you. Um, well, but said, I, just yeah, opened, I, I, just, I just opened up my computer to the – since I want Census 2020 right now. Oh, okay. Yeah, it should just be available. Um, you don't have to go through the decennial or the 2020 census page, just census.gov academy or slash academy, and that will take you to the training resources. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. I'm sorry to take up some of your time. It's yeah. really, really wonderful to hear all this. Thanks, Thank much. I appreciate it. Bye. Our next question comes from Rhonda. Your line is open. Hello. Um, I wanted to know, um, I've, I've applied like, for like the last three or four months, uh, filling out forms on, uh, on my uh, phone to, uh, work on the census. And I've never received anything from them. But would you say that, uh, I can go to the website, um, could you give me that, 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 website address again to uh, apply? Yes. So it's 2020census.gov slash jobs. And at the top, um, there are some links about job details, pay and location, mm -hmm. how to apply, and then after you apply. So if you already are in our system, if you go to the after you apply link, that will kind of walk you through the different steps and what you can expect. Okay, 2020 census back up. Uh, yep, slash jobs. Slash jobs. Okay. Yep. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from Ronald Ragland. Your line is open. Yes, ma'am, how are you today? I'm good, uh, thanks. Yes, ma'am, I applied to do a census taker, and hopefully I'll get it, and we'll see. What I'm asking is, what would be, I'm an early person, morning person, as you could say, and a late person, but uh, what would be your hours or what would be considered the hours to go out in the field? What would be those hours to do that? Sure. So that really varies across the country. Um, we try to send our census takers out when people are home. So in areas where uh, the majority of people work outside their homes, uh, census takers will be visiting in the later afternoon and early evening and on weekends. Um, we will also send people out during the day. We, f we try to reach houses multiple times before uh, at, to get people to respond. So it's really going to vary depending on where you are and the characteristics of the neighborhood that you live in. Okay. I'm sorry, I can't be more specific. Oh, I understand. <laughs> you never know when people are home, that's for sure. I just noticed, I didn't know if there was a like a cutoff time in the afternoon, like dinner time or something like that, that you wouldn't go out and bother anybody. That's all I was just wondering. Yeah, um, you know, I don't know what, is the, what the exact things say in the training, but we are trying to reach people while they're at home. That being said, we also want it to be safe for our census takers. So I can't imagine we send people around in the dark. I understand. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. You have a good Thank day. You. you too. Bye-bye. Our next question comes from David Strange. Your line is open. Good evening, folks. How are you guys? Good. Thank you. Uh, I'm a field supervisor for the Tampa area, and um, I wanted to ask what what is the best way to overcome an objective from someone or to help employees to overcome an objective from someone that has an issue with data breach? Now, I know you've covered the, um, you know, we don't share the information with anyone, and that's really great, but with all the data breaches across the country in different banking and institutions and areas, there is that 
stigma out there, you know, that our data may not be safe. So how do we overcome that objective, either with teaching an employee or by talking to the average homeowner about what we do in order to keep it, the information safe from data breach? Sure. So we have been lucky enough to work with technology leaders, not only across the government, but also in the private sector. And we're following the best practices set out um, by those technology leaders to secure our systems. We have gone through multiple rounds of security testing, and um, we are confident in our systems. We do have for you some fact sheets on the um, on our IT system. So if you go to that um, 2020 census.gov slash partners and go to the outreach materials, you should be able to find some fact sheets on that that should help both your employees and homeowners. Wonderful, ma'am. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. And Victor, before we open up the line for the next um, question, would you mind giving us a, a, an idea how many people are queued up? Uh, we currently have about 23 folks queued up. Okay. Um, well, yeah. Unfortunately, I don't. I don't believe we're going to be able to get through all of your questions today. We are reaching the top of the hour here. Um, so I would highly encourage you, if you are on the line waiting to have your question answered, if you have the ability to do so, please send that question via chat and we will do our best to get back to you in a timely manner. Um, we just want to be respectful of everybody's time and we are scheduled for one hour today, but we appreciate your interest and all of the questions that you've been um, a asking us today. They're really great. So I think we have about, we have time for about maybe two more questions and then um, we'll go ahead and conclude the call for today. This does conclude today's conference. Thank you for your participation. You may disconnect your lines at this time. Speakers, please hold for post-conference. <laughs> oh, man. I just got really warm. <laughs>